Hello and welcome to Weird Tales Podcast. My name is Daniel and I am your host. This is a show where I speak about weird tales the world over, famous people, battles, monsters and more. If you like what you hear, please follow us on Spotify and subscribe to our Instagram page on at Weird Tales Podcast. I hope you enjoy today's episode and let's go. Hello everybody and welcome to episode 2 of the Weird Tales podcast. Today we are going to talk about Jack Johnson. He was the first African American heavyweight champion in boxing. And he was quite the character. He won the title in 1908. And um, this was at the time quite controversial for obvious reasons. But we are going to discuss his entire life today. And there's no better way than to start in his early life. Johnson was born on March 31, 1878. And he was the third child of nine to his parents, Henry and Tina Johnson. They were both uh, former slaves who worked service jobs and his father actually served as a civilian teamster of the Union's 38 Colored Infantry. And his father described Johnson as the most perfect, perfect physical specimen that he has ever seen. Uh, and Johnson, he grew, grew up in um, Galveston, Texas. And during this time, I mean, school was not really a priority, but Johnson attended five years of school. And he was described in early age as very frail, but also tough. Like all his siblings, he was expected to work. And the man has stated himself that although he grew up in the south in Texas, he um, always maintained that segregation was really not an issue for him. Uh, and many talk about that is because the city of Galveston, where he uh, was born and raised, are it's a little bit of a secluded city, so. The man has been quoted to say that growing up, I grew up with a gang of white boys in which I never felt victimized or excluded. I grew up and they were my friends, they were my pals. I ate with them, I played with them and I slept at their homes. Their mothers gave me cookies and I ate at their table. No one ever taught me that white men were superior to me. And it sounds kind of beautiful but at the time we don't really need to discuss further I mean it's a long way to go to 1965 so however he has credited his mother uh, Tina to be a huge uh, influence in his own life when he was when he was younger he was actually kind of known as a little bit of a coward and his sister Lucy would protect him and After he came home, sometimes bruised and crying from school, his mom actually warned him that if he were to get beat at school, then she would whip him when he got home. And her method actually scared him to learn the lessons he needed to protect himself. And after his mother scolded him, more or less, at the house, 
and threatened to beat him if he got beat up again. He never lost a fight in uh, to a schoolboy again. And um, yeah, as stated earlier, he stayed five years in school. And after he quit school, he began a job working at uh, the local docks. And he tried working other jobs around the town. Uh, but eventually he moved his way to Dallas, finding work at a racetrack, exercising horses. And Jack stuck with this job until uh, he found a new apprenticeship with a carriage painter by the name of Walter Lewis. And, um, and the thing about Walter Lewis, he enjoyed watching... Uh, friends spar in boxing and this is where the seeds began be planted at in uh, Jack to began began to learn how to box and he actually had credited Walter Lewis to um, to be one of the catalysts to make him become a boxer when uh, Johnson was 16 he moved to New York City and he actually found living arrangement with a guy called the Barbados Joe Walcott. And he actually was a welterweight fighter from the West Indies. And he took in Jack, so let him stay with him. And Jack found again work exercising horses for the local stable. But he was actually fired later on because he exhausted a horse too much so it couldn't really race anymore so getting fired he moved back to Galveston and he was hired as a janitor at a gym owned by a German-born heavyweight fighter called Herman Berno where Johnson he actually worked there and saved enough money to buy his first pair of boxing gloves and he began sparring every chance he got and at the same time where he was trying to train and spar as much as gun, he actually was arrested for brawling with a, with a guy named David Person. And um, David Person accused Johnson of turning him, turning him into the police over a game of craps. But both of the guys were arrested and released from jail. And because no one would talk to the, to the police and later on they actually met at the docks later and Johnson beat person in front of a quite uh, quite the crowd and this gave him a chance to fight in a summer boxing league again uh, against a man called John must have it Lee and yeah that was his name and nickname it's uh, kind of funny uh, because price, price fighting at the time was illegal in Texas the fight was broken up at start and they were restarted down at the beach and Johnson won his first fight and his first uh, prize purse also and you might be surprised that this was not really that much it was one dollar and fifty cents he got for his first professional fight or his first fight where he actually won uh, money on it so Johnson made his debut as a professional boxer on November 1st 1898 in Galveston where he knocked out Charlie Brooks in the second round of a 15 round bout and it was billed as the Texas State middleweight title and a funny thing about Jack Johnson, he was known as the Galveston Giant. And he was six foot and a half inch, and that is in centimeters, 184 centimeters. So he was called the Giant, but I mean, looking at some of the heavyweights today we have um, one of the heavyweight champions Tyson Fury he's I think he's six foot nine so yeah he was a giant of the time more or less however uh, in his uh, third pro fight on May 8th 1899 he faced Clone Dyke uh, renamed 
John W. Haynes or Haynes, an African American heavyweight known as the Black Hercules in uh, Chicago, but he was he was known more as Klondike, and that was because he um, he liked the gold up in Klondike, Alaska, where he was uh, trying to trying to get gold. So, and this guy Klondike or John W. Haynes, he had declared himself the Black Heavyweight Champ. Uh, and he won a technical knockout in the fifth round of a scheduled six rounder and the two fighters uh, met twice again in the year 1900 with the first rematch resulting in a draw as both fighters were on their feet at the end of 20 rounds and quick side note here when it comes to boxing matches during this time today I think they go maximum 12 uh, rounds in, in fights and uh, or 15 but at this time there re wasn't really that much of a regulation so sometimes there were 20 rounds and sometimes there were 10 or 6 it depended on the rules on where uh, the rules at the place where the fights took place so don't get alarmed when I say that at the end of 20 rounds or something like that it's um, it was normal for the time but Johnson won the third fight by TKO uh, when Klondike refused to come out at the end of the fourth 14th round and Johnson actually did not claim Klondike's unrecognized title as the black heavyweight champion and on um, at this time Johnson he, he had picked up steam and it was going quite well but on February 25th 1901 Johnson fought Joe Shosky in Galveston and Shosky was a popular and experienced heavyweight and he actually knocked Johnson out in the third round and Price, fi price fighting, as I stated earlier, was illegal in Texas at the time, and they got both arrested. And the bail for both men was set at five thousand dollars each. And being 1901, this was quite the the sum to pay up to to post bail and get out. So none of the guys could uh, could afford it. But uh, a funny thing about this is that they they spend uh, the days in the jail cell, and they were permitted by the sheriff to go home at night, as long as they agree to spar in the jail cell. So large crowd began to gather to watch these sparring sessions, and. I don't know if the sheriff and the police were actually, you know, selling tickets to, to people to watch the fights or anything. It would not surprise me, uh, but this is uh, this is what happened. After 23 days in jail, their bail was reduced to an affordable level, and a, a grand jury refused to indict either one of them. So they were free to go. And Johnson later stated that he learned his boxing skills during this jail time. And he and Chomsky was, became friends and they were friends until they both passed away. And Johnson attested his success in boxing to come from the coaching that he received from Chomsky. And Chomsky saw a natural talent and determination in Johnson and taught him the nuance of uh, defense and he uh, stated and I quote a man who can move like you should never have to take a punch so Johnson later then beat former black heavyweight champion Frank Childs on October 21 1902 and Childs had twice won the black heavyweight title and uh, he claimed that he was the true black heavyweight champion despite having lost his title 
against uh, George Byers and then he retook the title from Byers and lost it again to Denver Ed Martin so he claimed the unrecon unrecognized black heavyweight title uh, but Johnson won by TKO in the 12th round of a scheduled 20 rounders when uh, when Shiles uh, second signaled that he could not uh, go on and they claimed a dislocated elbow the defeat by Johnson forever ended Child's pretensions to, to be the black uh, heavyweight crown again. And by 1903, though uh, Johnson's official record showed him with nine wins, three losses, five draws and two no contests, he had had at least 50 fights against both white and black opponents that he actually had won. But as we talked about earlier, during this time it was boxing was kind of different, so not all fights went on the record and such. So in, on February 3rd, 1903, Johnson beat Denver Ed Martin on points in a 20 round match for the World Colored Heavyweight Championship. Johnson hold, held that title until it was vacated when he won the world heavyweight title from Tommy Burns in uh, Sydney, Australia in 1908. And a fun thing about his reign, uh, reign as colored heavyweight champion is that his reign was 2,151 days and that is the third longest in the 60 year history of the colored heavyweight title only Harry Williams and Peter Jackson held the title longer so they had 3,103 days and Peter Jackson had 3,041 days and Johnson defended the colored heavyweight title 17 times which was second only to Harry Willis that defended the title 26 times. While Johnson was the color champ, he defeated colored ex champs Denver Ed Martin and Frank Shiles again and beat future colored heavyweight champ Sam McWee three times and Sam Longford once. He beat Langford on points in a 15 round uh, fight and never gave him a shot at the title again. So now we move to the World Heavyweight Championship. And unfortunately, in fighting, it's a lot of politics even today. And during Johnson's times, I think it was even more. And <clears throat> something we uh, must take into the consideration here is that the heavyweight champion at the time was a man called James J. Jeffries and he refused to face and fight Jack Johnson and instead of fighting him he retired instead and uh, this made the title vacate for a while uh, and Johnson fought for the world heavyweight champion on heavyweight championship on December 26th, 1908. And he was the first African American heavyweight champion, but the first African American boxing champion was a guy named Joe Gans, and he won his lightweight championship 6 years before Johnson did, but and this is just something in boxing that when it comes to weight divisions the heavyweight championship is the most prestigious and this is just personal opinion but when it comes to the big guys fighting it's it's like for many people it's more exciting so when it comes to the baddest dude on the planet the heavyweight champion is usually the guy everybody points to so Johnson and a Canadian called Tommy Burns met at the Sydney Stadium at 
in Australia. And this came after Johnson actually followed Burns around the world for two years and taunting him, taunting him in um, the press and everything to, to get this match. And Burns agreed to fight Johnson only after promoters guaranteed him Burns that he would have a fight purse on in uh, $30,000 and the fight lasted 14 rounds before actually being stopped by police in front of 20,000 spectators in Australia and Johnson's Johnson was declared the winner and when it comes to this fight Johnson was winning and the crowd being not in Johnson's corner they got more and more agitated so the reason the police stopped the fight and declared Johnson the winner and gave him the belt in the locker room was because they would not they did not want a full scale riot in the stadium and I don't know if this is confirmed but the rumors is that someone fired a gun and, and such against the ring because they were so angry that Johnson was actually winning against Burns and Johnson was now the heavyweight champion to uh, say that after Johnson's victory over Burns racial animosity among the white the whites ran pretty deep so it was a lot of um, people that did not like Johnson being the heavyweight champion in boxing and uh, a lot of people cried out for someone to take the title away from him and this actually includes uh, the famous American author Jack London and uh, he has been quoted to call for a great white hope to take the title away from Johnson. And Johnson, he was covered more in the press than any other notable black man uh, during this time. And, and the lead up to the bout for the heavyweight title was peppered with a lot of racist press against Johnson. Even the New York Times wrote, uh, wrote of the event, uh, and I quote, If the black man wins, thousands and thousands of his ignorant brothers will misinterpret this victory as justifying claims to much more than mere physical equality with their white neighbors. That is the New York Times in 1908. So, yeah there was a lot of tensions and because Johnson was now the world champion he had to fight a series of contenders and fighters and uh, almost every one of them was billed as the great white hope and it was often in exhibition matches and in 1909 he beat Tony Ross, Al Kaufman, and the middleweight champion Stanley Ketchell. But the thing about the Ketchell fight is that both Ketchell and Johnson were friends. And many people that was watching the fight, they thought that they saw an exhibition. And an exhibition for people that don't really follow boxing. It's a, it's a show fight where you don't really go to hurt each other and uh, both fight uh, both fighters Ketchell and Johnson they they fought in the way of an exhibition until the 12th round where Ketchell threw a right to Johnson's head and this actually knocked him down and Johnson quickly when was up on his feet again but he was really annoyed so he dashed straight at Ketchell and threw a single uh, uppercut uh, to uh, Ketchell's jaw and he knocked him out and um, this punch actually knocked out Ketchell's front teeth and you can actually see in film from this fight 
that Johnson removed the teeth from his glove uh, because the uh, catch of front to tooth or teeth were embedded in the boxing glove so he, he was forced to, to pull them out. Next we have what was billed at the time as the fight of the century or the Johnson Jeffries prize fight and it was a fight between Jack Johnson the world heavyweight champion and the previous undefeated world heavyweight champion James G. Jeffries and James G. Jeffries was the guy that held the title before Johnson captured it and he was the guy that did not want to fight Johnson and retired instead of a fighting in his words a black man and this fight took place on July 4th 1910 so it's on the Independence Day for the United States and this is one of those things that was very significant in the history of race relations in the US and this actually led to uh, riots after after the fight and we're going to talk about that a little bit later but first the fight uh, this was one of the most eagerly anticipated boxing matches of all time and the, the betting odds were favoring Jeffries who um, came back from retirement to, to fight Johnson and it was once again a lot of racist press against Johnson and once again the author Jack London comes back here with a quote and he described Jeffries two days before the fight as and I quote the chosen representative of the white race and this time the greatest of them and here comes the New York Times again and they wrote in an editorial once again the quote about if the black man won wins this is will be uh, a catalyst for uh, his ignorant brothers to uh, see that the white the white people are lower than than the black but let's get to the fight Johnson and Jeffries fought uh, and in the 15 round approximately one hour after the fight began Jeffries went down and he actually boasted that he had never been knocked down in a fight before the Johnson fight but he went down three times to Johnson's punches and he got counted out when his manager called the fight so the manager for Jeffries called the fight to be over because Jeffries was taking a, a pounding more or less and the crowd of 18,020 people in the stadium was the audience and both Johnson and Jeffries both made over $100,000 uh, for this fight and this was not only from the fight purses but they also got a percentage of the film rights because this fight was actually filmed and for a time the Johnson Jeffries fight was the most watched and giving uh, the most public attention in the United States than any other film to date <clears throat> and this was something that stood until five years later when the movie The Birth of a Nation was uh, released and for those who do not know about the movie A Birth of a Nation it's basically a Ku Klux Klan rally movie and it's yeah, to say the least it's a really racist movie but the outcome of this fight triggered race riots uh, that evening the 4th of July all across the United States from Texas to New York Washington and California 
and uh, this ended up being um, race riots in more than 25 states and 50 cities and it has been qu credited that around 20 people were killed in the riots and hundreds more were uh, injured so yeah it was um, not well received that Johnson won won that fight and something about Johnson when he was heavyweight champion was that he did not really fight black opponents for you know or he didn't fight black opponents for the first five years and he denied matches against um, many black heavyweights and uh, even though <coughs> even the heavyweights that was the col colored heavyweight champions but uh, he claimed that he did not give the title fights to to black champions because he could make more money fighting white boxers or white fighters and um, this was something that made what at the time was called the color bar remained uh, so white fighters fought white fighters and black fighters fought black fighters but he gave a title fight to uh, a man named Sam Langford that or he the rumor was that he he gave a title fight to uh, to a man named Sam Langford to fight him in Paris but this did not happen and it uh, did not happen but and Johnson alleged that Langford was unable to raise $30,000 for a guaranteed uh, fight purse um, and um, one of the black heavyweights uh, called Joe Jeanette actually criticized Johnson and told and said and I quote Jack forgot about his old friends when he became champion and he drew the color line against his own people but in 1913 Johnson agreed to uh, take on a black opponent and this was not Sam Langford as was rumored at the start uh, and Sam Langford was the current color heavyweight champion he gave the title shot against a man that was called battling Jim Johnson and he was a lesser known boxer who actually three years earlier had lost to Sam Langford um so he was not the guy everybody thought that he was gonna uh, get a title shot so they fought in December 19 in Paris and this was billed as Johnson versus Johnson and this was for the world heavyweight championship however this was billed as a heavyweight title fight but it turned out to be more of an exhibition and neither of the guys actually fought so the crowd in attendance and the press and everything deemed this fight to be really bad because they met in a 10 run a 10 uh, round fight and this ended in a draw because neither of the fighters had been able to finish the other opponent and Johnson claimed, Jack Johnson claimed that he uh, could only use his right hand in the fight. But doctors made an examination and they said that he had a slight fracture on, on his left arm. And this called that Johnson was like telling the truth that he was not really going after it when he fought. So and uh, because of the draw Jack Johnson kept his championship uh, because at this time when a draw or even today when a draw in a championship fight happens the champion that was going into the title fight keeps uh, the belt so however 
it was time for Johnson to lose his title and he did this on April 5th 1915 and he lost his title to Jess Willard uh, a guy from Kansas who started boxing when he was 27 years old and this fight took place on Ori Oriental Race uh, Park racetrack in Havana Cuba in front of 25,000 people and Johnson was knocked out in the 26th round of a scheduled 45 round fight and what is a little bit strange about this fight is that Johnson had won almost every round and began to tire after the 20th round and he he was hurt by body punches from Willard but and then he got knocked out in the 26th round and the rumor have been that Johnson took a dive in this fight and Jess Willard who, who won the fight he has always maintained that he uh, won the fight outright fair but many people thought Johnson purposely threw the fight because Willard was white and um, and he wanted kind of out of the public eye he he was tired and some people that have watched the fight maintain that Johnson threw it but it has never been proven so after losing his world heavyweight championship Johnson never again fought for the world or the colored heavyweight championships and his popula popularity remained very strong through all, all these years and he actually continued to fight and uh, even though age was kind of catching up to him and officially he fought professionally until 1938 at the age of 60 when he lost seven of his last nine bouts and he lost his final fight to a man called Walter P Price by seventh round TKO'd and a weird thing about this is that it's suggested that after the age of 40 your losses or wins are not actually counted of your on your official record so many of the fights uh, Jack Johnson had after he turned 40 was not added to his um, his record and it also has been very speculated that he took a lot of what what was known at the time as seller fights where um, private audiences and, and people with a lot of um, a lot of money pays fighters to fight in, in private showings and Johnson made his final ring appearance at the age of 67 on November 22nd 27th 1945 uh, fighting a three one minute exhibition round against two opponents and this was against Joe Jeanette and John Balkard and this was a, a showmanship fight that was for um, a benefit for US war bonds because during 1945 the, the fight the, the world the second world war was still going on so so that was Jack Johnson's um, fight career and you know he was credited to have a, a very good fighting technique that his fighting style was it was kind of unique for him during this time that he um, he would go out and strike first but he, he would then kind of roll back and fought and fight defensively so his opponent tire out and he becomes more and more aggressive during the rounds as it goes further because if he can get his opponent tired he could punish them later on and knock them out so he uh, he was he had a quite unique style for the time so in private life he um, was because of his fame he was uh, offered a lot of endorsement for products medicines and 
this was good because he had um, he had some expensive hobbies. He uh, he was into automobile racing and tailored clothing and jewelry and furs and um, and jewelry and furs was for him and his wife or wives. I'm going to talk about his wife so a little bit later on. Um, <clears throat> he um, the funny story about him because he he liked racing cars. Uh, legally or illegally and it's a funny story that once he was pulled over for a $50 speeding ticket and he gave the officer a hundred dollar bill and the officer protested against this and told him like I can't give you change for this this is too much and Johnson replied that he was gonna keep the change because he was gonna go he was gonna go to a place and they drive back the same way so he was gonna speed when he came back so they could keep the change and um, he was a very flashy man and, and um, this was not seen as super good in the white community but also in the black African American community and the scholar Booker T. Washington actually said that about Johnson that it's and I quote it's unfortunate that a man with money should use it in a way to injure his own people in the eyes of those who are seeking to uplift his race and Im improve his con conditions, I wish to say emphatically that Jack Johnson's actions did not meet my personal approval, and I'm sure they do not meet with the approval of the colored race. So, yeah, he um, he was both really popular and also not that popular, but he uh, <clears throat> another thing about him that actually would re uh, lead to his arrest and imprisonment was that he um, he broke uh, kind of, uh, taboo at the time that and that uh, was consorting and dating uh, white women uh, and uh, this was not something that was uh, looked upon uh, with kind of kind eyes but over that, uh, Johnson actually in July 1912 opened an interracial nightclub in Chicago, Chicago called Café de Champion. Uh, and let's now get into Johnson's marriages. Uh, according to, to Johnson's own um, biography that he released in 1927, he claims that he married uh, a girl named Mary Austin a black woman from Galveston, Texas, but there is no records existing of this marriage, no, no legal documents. Um, and according to his more of his autobiography, he um, met a black prostitute named Clara Kerr in 1903, uh, but she robbed him with the help of Johnson's friend uh, a racehorse trainer named William Bryant. Uh, they stole jewelry and clothing and s things like that. But Johnson tracked the couple down and had Kerr arrested for burglary. And um, however, Johnson and Kerr they, they made up. They became a couple again. But she left him. Uh, then again. And. Uh, he was legally married three times and he was always claimed that it was always claimed that he was not faithful to his wives and this is what has been reported because in 1909 he met Edda Terry Durio sorry for butchering that but uh, she was a Brooklyn socialite and former wife of uh, a man named Clarence Dureo they met at a car race and uh, Johnson actually hired a private investigator to follow Durea 
around after he suspected her of having an affair with his chauffeur. And unfortunately, on Christmas Day, Janssen confronted Dereo and beat her to a point where she was forced to go to the hospital. However, they reconciled and were married on January 18th, 1911. However, his wife, Dereo, she was prone to depression and her condition did not um, become better because Johnson, he kept up the abuse and infidelity and all the bad press they got because they had an interracial relationship. And Dereo actually attempted suicide twice before she died from a self-inflicted gunshot uh, on September 11th, uh, 1912. So, yeah, he uh, not the best husband, to say the least. And in the summer of 1912, Johnson met Lucy Cameron, an 18-year-old prostitute from Minneapolis who had uh, relocated to Chicago and I don't know if she worked or if she was at his night cl- nightclub, uh, Café de Champion. And he hired her as um, a stenographer shortly, af- but shortly after his uh, wife's Dereo's funeral. He and Lucille were a couple. And they married on December 3rd, 1912. However, Cameron fa- filed for divorce in 1924 due to Johnson's repeated infidelity. And um, Johnson then met Irene Pinu at the racetrack in Illinois in 1924. Uh, and this was after she d- divorced her husband the following year. and. They, Johnson and her were married in Wakini on August, in August 1925. And they were actually together until Johnson's death in 1946. And uh, she had been quoted to say that when asked about what she loved most about him, she uh, had been quoted saying, I loved him because of his courage. He faced the world unafraid and he wasn't anybody or anything he feared. So, yeah, he um, he died in 1946. But uh, on October 18th, 1912, Johnson was arrested on the grounds that his relationship with second wife, Lucia Chameron, violated the so-called Man Act against transporting women across state lines for immoral purposes. And this was due to her being an alleged uh, prostitute. And her mother was in on some charges that she claimed that her daughter was insane and um, Johnson took advantage advantage of her insanity. But uh, Lucy Cameron, she refused to cooperate and the case fell apart and yeah uh, they, he was never charged with it but later that month in November uh, of 1912 he was arrested again on similar, similar similar charges and this time they had an, a prostitute named Bella Schreiber uh, that uh, accused him of the same thing that transporting women across straight lines because that turns it to a, to a federal crime so it's more uh, serious and he actually had been involved with Bella Schreiber between 1909 and 1910 and she testified against him and Johnson was convicted by um, an all-white jury in June 1913 and uh, a funny thing about this is that he got convicted before the passing of this so-called Man Act. Um, so to say that this was 
maybe a personal attack against Jack Johnson. This I, I, I'm not gonna sit and say that I know, but feels like it, and you can make your own predictions about this. And he got convicted, and he um, was sentenced to a year and a day in prison. And here it takes a little bit of a a weird turn. He actually skipped bail and left the country and met up his wife at the time, Lucy Cameron, in Montreal before fleeing to France. And he went over the border to Canada posing as a black baseball a member of a black baseball team. And the next seven years they lived in exile in Europe, South America and Mexico and um, until Johnson returned to the US on July 20th, 1920. And he surrendered to federal agents at the Mexican border. And he was sent to United States Peniten Penitentiary in Leavenworth to serve his sentence. And he was released on July 9th, 1921. However, he uh, and Johnson was actually presidential pardoned for his uh, crime where he uh, served the one year in prison for. He was post posthumously presidential pardoned by the president Donald J. Trump on uh, May 24th, 9, uh, 2018. This is, of course, 105 years after his conviction. And this actually happened because the actor, Sylvester Stallone, he uh, got a meeting with the president, uh, Donald Trump, and uh, gave uh, Trump the suggestion to pardon Johnson. And this is actually something that previously um, uh, administrations didn't had they hadn't done it and it was several attempts in 2008, 2009, 2016 to uh, pardon Jack Johnson but it, I don't really know why but they um, it, I think I believe when it comes to presidential pardon sometimes they have to go through the house and it, through the senate and, and things like that so but uh, on the 24th of May 2018, as said, he was pardoned posthumously, and this was a ceremony with um, Sylvester Stallone attending, and at the time, the current WBC champion Deontay Wilder, and former champion Lennox Lewis, and the WBC president Mauricio Suleiman, and uh, Linda Bell Haywood. Who is Johnson's great great niece? So he got his pardon uh, only 105 years after his sentencing. And Johnson died on Uni June 10th, 1946. And this um, is kind of tragic because he and a friend visited a segregated dinner where the diner refused to serve him and he um, drove uh, drove away very angrily with his uh, friend in the passenger seat and he collided with a telegraph pole on US Highway 1 near Frank Franklinton, North Carolina. His friend survived the crash but Johnson suffered fatal injuries and died later that day at St. Agnes Hospital in North Carolina. And this was the nearest black hospital. And he died at the age of 68. Johnson is buried at Graceland Cemetery in Chicago next to his first wife, Edda Dury Johnson, who committed suicide, as we said before, in 1912. And his grave was actually initially unmarked, but it was later marked with a large tombstone, which says only Johnson. And in 2005, an additional marker was added by filmmaker Ken Burns because he was releasing a movie about Johnson's life. And 
next to the big gravestone a smaller gravestone can be read that says Jack Johnson 1878 1946 first black heavyweight champion of the world so to say that this guy does have a legacy in I mean not only boxing but also uh, race relations in uh, the United States it's it's no doubt about it I mean just to think about winning the title in 1908 and the crowd literally tries to kill you uh, it's it's an un it's really something you can't really think about if you I mean yeah and uh, he ended his boxing career and he uh, has been credited with fighting 114 fights and he won 80 uh, fortified by knock uh, knockout um, and at the time he um, was got the record for the longest professional career uh, having boxed for over 33 years from 1897 to 1931 and this record was actually beaten by Roy Jones Jr. in 2003 who had bought box more than 33 years and uh, I mean his legacy is undeniable he he was credited often by Muhammad Ali that he uh, that Ali was influenced by Jack Johnson um, because Ali, when he refused to fight in the Vietnam Vietnam, Vietnam War, um, he felt that he was ostracized in the same sense as Jack Johnson was when Johnson was the champ. So yeah, that is the life of Jack Johnson, the first heavyweight champion, or black heavyweight champion in boxing. Um, so thank you for listening. And I hope to hear from you guys. Uh, as I said in the intro, we have an Instagram page now at Weird Tales Podcast, where you can get updates about future ep- episodes. And uh, if you want, you can send me a direct message on Instagram with uh, suggestions for future topics. So I want to say thanks for listening. Have a good day. And I see you soon again. Goodbye.